Golden Age Hip Hop refers to mainstream hip hop music created from the mid or mid late 1980s to the early or early mid 1990s, particularly by artists and musicians originating from the New York metropolitan area. A precursor to the new school hip hop movement, it is characterized by its diversity, quality, innovation, and influence on overall hip hop after the genre's emergence and establishment in the old school era and is associated with the development and eventual mainstream success of hip-hop. There were various types of subject matter, while the music was experimental and the sampling from old records was eclectic. The artists most often associated with the period are LL Cool J, Slick Rick, Ultra Magnetic MCs, The Jungle Brothers, Run DMC, Public Enemy, Beastie Boys, KRS-One, DJ Jazzy Jeff and The Fresh Prince, Eric B and Rakim, De La Soul, Big Daddy Kane, APMD, Bismarcky, Salt and Peppa Queen Latifah, Gangstar, and A Tribe Called Quest. Releases by these acts coexisted in this period with early gangsta rap artists such as School Lee D, Ice-T, Ghetto Boys, NWA, The Sex Raps of Two Live Crew and Two Short, and party-oriented music by acts such as The Fat Boys, MC Hammer, and Vanilla Ice. The Golden Age is noted for its innovation, a time when it seemed that every new single reinvented the genre, according to Rolling Stone. Referring to hip-hop in its Golden Age spins editor-in-chief S.I.E. Michel said, there were so many important, groundbreaking albums coming out right about that time, and MTV's Sway Callaway added, the thing that made that era so great is that nothing was contrived. Everything was still being discovered and everything was still innovative and new. Writer William Jelani Cobb said, what made the era they inaugurated worthy of the term golden was the sheer number of stylistic innovations that came into existence, in these golden years, a critical mass of mic prodigies were literally creating themselves and their art form at the same time. The term golden age hip-hop frames the late 1980s in mainstream hip-hop, said to be characterized by its diversity, quality, innovation, and influence, and associated with Public Enemy, KRS-One, and his Boogie Down Productions, Eric B. and Rakim, Ultra Magnetic MCS 2223 De La Soul, A Tribe Called Quest, and The Jungle Brothers due to their themes of Afrocentricity and political militancy, their experimental music, and their eclectic sampling. This same period is sometimes referred to as mid-school or a middle school in hip-hop, the phrase covering acts such as Gangstar, The UMCs, Main Source, Lord Finesse, APMD, Just Ice, Stetsasonic, True Mathematics, and Mantronics. The innovations of Run DMC, LL Cool J, and new school hip hop producers such as Larry Smith and Rick Rubin of Def Jam Recordings were quickly advanced on by Beastie Boys, Marley Marl, and his Juice Crew MCS. Boogie Down Productions, Public Enemy, and Eric B. and Rakim. Hip-hop production became denser, rhymes and beats faster, as the drum machine was augmented with the sampler technology. Rakim took lyrics about the art of rapping to new heights, while KRS-One and Chuck D pushed message rap towards black activism. Native tongues artists' inclusive, sample-crowded music accompanied their positivity, Afrocentricity and playful energy. During the golden age of hip-hop, samples were heavily used. The ability to sample different beats, riffs and patterns from a wide variety of sources gave birth to a new breed of producers and DJs who did not necessarily need formal musical training or instruments, just a good ear for sound collages. These samples were derived from a number of genres, ranging from jazz, funk, and soul to rock and roll. For example, Paul's Boutique, Beastie Boys' second studio album, drew from over 200 individual samples, 24 of which were featured on the last track of the album. Samples and sound bites were not limited to just music. RZA of the Wu Tang Clan, a hip hop collective formed in the 1990s, sampled sound clips from his own collection of 1970s kung fu films to bolster and frame the group's gritty lyrical content. Many of the sample-laden albums released during this time would not be able to receive legal clearance today. The era also provided some of the greatest advances in rapping technique. Cool G Rap, 
referring to the golden age in the book How to Rap said, that era bred rappers like a Big Daddy Kane, a KRS-1, a Rakim, a Chuck D, their rapping capability and ability, these dudes were phenomenal. Many of hip-hop's biggest artists were also at their creative peak. All Music said the Golden Age witnessed the best recordings from some of the biggest rappers in the genre's history, overwhelmingly based in New York City, Golden Age rap is characterized by skeletal beats, samples cribbed from hard rock or soul tracks, and tough diss raps, rhymers like P.E.'s Chuck D, Big Daddy Kane, KRS-One, Rakim, and LL Cool J basically invented the complex wordplay and lyrical kung fu of later hip-hop. In addition to lyrical self-glorification, hip-hop was also used as a form of social protest. Lyrical content from the era often drew attention to a variety of social issues including Afrocentric living, drug use, crime and violence, religion, culture, the state of the American economy, and the modern man's struggle. Conscious and political hip-hop tracks of the time were a response to the effects of American capitalism and former President Reagan's conservative political economy. According to Trisha Rose, in rap, relationships between black cultural practice, social and economic conditions, technology, sexual and racial politics, and the institution policing of the popular terrain are complex and in constant motion. Even though hip-hop was used as a mechanism for different social issues it was still very complex with issues within the movement itself. There was also often an emphasis on black nationalism. Hip-hop scholar Michael Eric Dyson stated, during the golden age of hip-hop, from 1987 to 1993, Afrocentric and black nationalist rap were prominent and critic Scott Thill described the time as the golden age of hip-hop the late 80s and early 90s when the form most capably fused the militancy of its Black Panther and Watts Prophet's forebears with the wide-open cultural experimentalism of De La Soul and others. Stylistic variety was also prominent, MSNBC said that in the Golden Age. Rappers had an individual sound that was dictated by their region and their communities, not by a marketing strategist, the Village Voice referred to the Golden Age's eclecticism, and Ben Dwinker and Dennis Martin of Empirical Musicology Review wrote that the constant flow of new, boundary-pushing Golden Age album releases exemplifies this era's unprecedented stylistic fluidity. The specific time period that the Golden Age covers varies among different sources and may overlap with other subcurrents in hip-hop. All Music writes, Hip-Hop's Golden Age is bookended by the commercial breakthrough of Run DMC in 1986 and the explosion of predominantly West Coast gangsta rap with N.W.A. in the late 80s and Dr. Dre and Snoop Doggy Dogg in 1993. 1. The New York Times described Hip-Hop's Golden Age as the late 1980s and early 90s. 44 Ed Simons of the Chemical Brothers said, there was that golden age of hip-hop in the early 90s when the Jungle Brothers made Straight Out the Jungle and De La Soul made Three Feet High and Rising 45, though these records were in fact made in 1988 and 1989 respectively. MSNBC called the 1980s the golden age of hip-hop music. The Guardian states, the golden age of hip-hop, from 1986 to 1993, gave the world an amazing number of great records, and also describes the period in November 1993, when a tribe called Quest and Wu-Tang Clan released albums, as the next Golden Age. The Golden Age is described by scholar Mickey Hess as circa 1986-1994. Carl Stoffers of New York Daily News describes the Golden Age as spanning from approximately 1986 to 1997. Brad Callas of Medium.com writes that hip-hop's golden age is loosely bookended by the genre's commercial breakthrough in the late 1980s and the back-to-back -back deaths of Tupac and Biggie in the late 1990s. In their article In Search of the Golden Age Hip-Hop Sound, music theorists Ben Dwinker and Dennis Martin of Empirical Musicology Review use the 11 years between and including 1986 and 1996 as chronological boundaries to define the golden age, bookend by the releases of Raising Hell and License to Ill Sick and the deaths of Tupac Shakur and the notorious B.I.G. For Will Lavin of You Discover Music states it's generally accepted that the Golden Age occurred from the mid-80s and mid-90s, it was then that all the elements of the culture, breaking, graffiti art and DJing, 
broke cover to enter the mainstream. Music critic Tony Green, in the book Classic Material, refers to the two-year period 1993 to 1994 as a second golden age that saw influential, high-quality albums using elements of past classicism, drum machines, Roland TR-808, drum samplers, Akai MPC-60, Emu SP-1200, turntable scratches, references to old-school hip-hop hits, and tongue-twisting triplet verbalisms, while making clear that new directions were being taken. Green lists as examples the Wu-Tang Clan's Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers, NAS's Illmatic, De La Soul's 1993 release Berlin Mind State, Snoop Doggy Dog's Doggy Style, A Tribe Called Quest's third album Midnight Marauders and Outcast's Southern Playlist to Cadillac Music. Dart Adams of Festival Peak described this second golden era as spanning 1992 to 1996, and cites the release of Puff Daddy and Maza's Can't Nobody Hold Me Down in 1997 as being the start of mainstream rap's jiggy era. According to copyright, music, and pop culture scholars Kembrew McLeod and Peter DeCola, the golden age of hip-hop sampling spans from 1987 to 1992. Artists and record labels were not yet aware of the permanence of hip-hop culture in mainstream media, and did not yet accept it as a legitimate institution. They believe the ruling made in Grand Upright Music, Limited v. Warner Brothers. Records Incorporated marked the end of the golden age of hip-hop and its sampling practices. Notable hip-hop producer and innovator, Marley Marl, formed the Juice Crew Hip Hop Collective. Marl also founded Cold Chillin' Records and assembled various hip-hop acts, including MC Shan, Big Daddy Kane, Biz Markey, Roxanne Shante, Cool G Rap and DJ Polo, and Masta Ace. Juice Crew Collective was an important force in ushering the Golden Age era of hip-hop, with advances in lyrical technique, distinctive personalities of emerging artists like Biz Markey and Big Daddy Kane, and attaining crossover commercial success for hip-hop music. Marley Marl's first production was an answer record to Sucker MCS in 1983 entitled Sucker DJs by Dimples D. Soon after came 14-year-old Roxanne Shantae's answer to UTFO's Roxanne Roxanne, Roxanne's Revenge, 1985, sparking off the huge wave of answer records known as the Roxanne Wars. More disses, insults intended to show disrespect, from Shantae followed, Bite This, 1985, Queen of Rocks, 1985, Introducing Bismarcky on Def Fresh Crew, 1986, Payback, 1987, and Have a Nice Day, 1987. Shantae's Have a Nice Day had aimed some barbs at the principal two members of a new group from the Bronx called Boogie Down Productions, BDP now KRS-One you should go on vacation with that name sounding like a whack radio station, and as for Scott LaRock, you should be ashamed, when T. LaRock said it's yours, he didn't mean his name. Boogie Down Productions had manufactured a disagreement with the Juice Crew's MC Shan, releasing South Bronx and The Bridges over in reply to his The Bridge and Kill That Noise respectively. KRS-One considered Run DMC the epitome of rap music in 1984 and had begun to rap following their lead. He has also said that BDP's approach reflected a feeling that the early innovators like Run DMC and LL Cool J were by 1986 tainted by commercial success and out of touch with the streets. Boogie Down's first album Criminal Minded, 1987, admitted a reggae influence and had KRS-One imitating the Beatles' Hey Jude on the title track. It also contained two tales of grim street life, yet played for callous laughs, The P is Free, in which KRS speaks of throwing out his girl who wants crack cocaine in exchange for sex, and 9mm goes bang, in which he shoots a drug dealer then cheerfully sings la 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 la. Songs like these presaged the rise of an underground that matched violent lyrics to the hardcore drum machine tracks of the new school. The cover of Criminal Minded was a further reflection of a move towards the sort of radical image, depicting the group in a half-light, holding firearms. The next album by All Means Necessary, 1988, left that element behind for political radicalism following the murder of Scott LaRock, 
with its title and cover alluding to Malcolm X KRS One became involved with the Stop the Violence movement at this time. Boogie Down Productions, along with Run DMC and Public Enemy, associated the new school as rap music with a strong message. Eric B. and Rakim appeared with the Marley Marl produced Eric B. is president and My Melody on Zakia Records in 1986. Both tracks appeared on Paid in Full, 1987. Just as Boogie Down Productions had, the pair reflected changes in street life on their debut's cover, which depicted the two wearing large gold chains and surrounded by money. Like Criminal Minded, the sampling prevalent in the album cemented James Brown's status as a hip-hop source, while Rakim's allusions showed the growing influence of mystic Islam offshoot the nation of gods and earths in hip-hop. The music was minimalist, austerely so, with many writers noting that coupled with Rakim's precise, logical style, the effect was almost one of scientific rigor. The group followed paid in full with Follow the Leader, 1988, Let the Rhythm Hit Him, 1990, and Don't Sweat the Technique, 1992. Rakim is generally regarded as the most cutting edge of the MCS of the New School era, Jess Harvell in Pitchfork in 2005 wrote that Rakim's innovation was applying a patina of intellectual detachment to rap's most sacred cause, talking shit about how you're a better rapper than everyone else. Robert Christ Gaw in The Village Voice in 1990 wrote of Rakim's style as calm, confident, clear. On their third album, as on their face-shifting 1986 debut, he continues, Eric B.S. samples truly are beats, designed to accentuate the natural music of an idealized black man's voice. Looking back at the late 80s in Rolling Stone in 1997, Ed Morales describes Rakim as the new school MC of the moment, using a smooth baritone to become the jazz soloist of mystic Afrocentric rap. Public Enemy, having been reluctantly convinced to sign to a record label, released Yo! Bum Rush the show on Def Jam in 1987. It debuted the Public Enemy logo, a circle of hat b-boy in a sniper's crosshairs, was replete with battle rhymes, my was it weighs a ton, Public Enemy hashtag 1, social political fair, right starter, message to a black man, and anti-crack messages, mega blast, dot the album was a critical and commercial success, particularly in Europe, unusually so for a hip-hop album at that time. Bum Rush the show had been recorded on the heels of Run DMC's Raising Hell, but was held back by Def Jam in order for them to concentrate on releasing and promoting Beastie Boys licensed to ill. Chuck D of Public Enemy felt that by the time their first record was released, Boogie Down Productions and Rakim had already changed the landscape for how an MC could rap. Public Enemy were already recording their second album It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, 1988 when Bum Rush hit stores. The underground sound, centered on urban violence, that was to become gangsta rap, existed on the East Coast soon after Run DMC had inaugurated the new school of hip-hop. Philadelphia School Lee D. self-released Gangsta Boogie in 1984, and PSK. What Does It Mean, Slash Gucci. Time in 1985, leading to Saturday Night, School Lee D., 1986, Jive, 1987. The West Coast, which became the home of gangsta rap, had Toddy T's influential Bataram mixtape in 1985, and Ice T 6 in the Morning in 1986 before N.W.A's first records, leading to the hugely successful Straight Outta Compton in 1988. Developments in the New York New School continuum in this climate were represented by the native tongues groups Jungle Brothers, De La Soul, a tribe called Quest, Queen Latifah, Chiali, and Money Love along with fellow travelers like leaders of the new school, KMD and Brand Nubian. They moved away from aggressive, macho posturing, towards ambiguity, fun and Afrocentricity. Their music was sample crowded, more open, and accessible than their new school predecessors. De La Soul's debut sampled everyone from the Turtles to Steely Dan, while a tribe called Quest matched tough beats to mellow jazz samples and playful, thoughtful raps. This lawsuit was known for effectively ending the Wild West period for sampling during the golden age of hip-hop. 
In 1991, Gilbert O'Sullivan's song publisher sued Warner Brothers Records over the use of the original in Bismarcky's song Alone Again. No copyright case precedents were cited in the ruling of the final verdict, and the presiding judge's opinion was prefaced with the words Thou shalt not steal. The 60s pop band The Turtles filed a lawsuit in 1989 against hip-hop group De La Soul for the uncleared use of a sampled element derived from their original 1968 track You Showed Me. The lawsuit was settled out of court for a reported $1.7 million, though group members later claimed that the actual payout was significantly less. Thank you for watching this video.